Okay, you guys, so for the last part of chapter 10, we're going to work on 10.3. However, in your homework, I believe this is 10.2. So this will be the last thing that we cover. Um, we're going to be building the regression equation, and it summarizes the relationship between two variables. Um, but if only one variable can explain the other or predict the other, thus the explanatory and response variables must be identifiable. The regression line is a straight line that describes how response variables Y can change as an explanatory variable X changes. So they're going to call this y hat. Oops. They're going to call this y hat. Um, so y hat equals a plus bx. You could just as easily write it as mx plus b. Um, remember, these are two different b's. This is the y intercept, and this is the slope, depending on if you're using the calculator. Um, so don't don't get confused with this b versus the calculator's b. They're two different b's. Um, but just in case you guys are more comfortable using y equals mx plus b. So basically, they give us these formulas, and we're not going to necessarily need to do these formulas <clears throat> because um, we're going to be using technology to find it. But I just wanted to show you that it actually works. So um, <clears throat> it says show the equation. I'm right here now. Show the equations b equals r times the standard deviation of the y's divided by the standard deviation of the x's and a equals y bar minus b x bar. I'm just going to do the one for the slope and um, just kind of trust that you guys could do the other one on your own. Give the same values as a calculator function. Okay, so what I did was I entered in these old faithful um, before and after or duration and interval and I plugged them into my calculator as list one and list two. Okay, and then I did second, uh, oh, hold on real quick, let me make sure I tell you guys the right thing. So I entered them in and then I did stat calculate two variable stats. So normally we just do one variable stats. I did two variable stats because we have two lists and it gave me the X bar, the standard deviation, everything like that for the X and if you scroll down, it also gives you the standard deviation, everything for the Y. So I found my S sub Y on the calculator was 12.166. I found my S sub X was 48.108. Then I used linear regression t-test to find my R value right here. And I ended up doing this math. So I used the formula right here. So this is the formula and I plugged all of this in. Okay. And then once I plugged this in, I ended up with 0.234. So this is my answer I get from using the equation, uh, the formula that they gave me. Now, if I just look on my calculator, it tells me that B and remember your calculator uses this from calc. They use Y um, equals a plus B X. So in this case, B is the actual slope, which if you notice is the same as um, the calculator slope and the one I found before. So I just wanted to quickly show you guys that these formulas actually are taking the two standard deviations and dividing them. The standard deviation of the Y coordinate um, divided by the standard deviation of the X coordinate, which gives us the slope when you multiply it by R. Okay, so a little bit calculator intense um, right there. <clears throat> Um, so we're going to basically, the, the point of the beginning of chapter 10 is to um, help us discover if things have a linear relationship. And then once we've discovered if they have a linear relationship, then we're going to build the line that um, comes from that. So let's look at this problem below. <clears throat> it says find the regression equation for predicting supermodel weights um, from height. Okay, so we got to take out our calculator. Uh, and we're going to plug all of these in. So um, I'm just going to do it by hand. I'm not going to do it on the uh, computer calculator. I'm just going to do it on my um, regular calculator. So hopefully you guys are doing this with me at home. So I'm editing my list. And I'm going to plug in 71, 70.5, 71, 72. 70, 70, 66.5, 70, and 71.
Okay, so there's only nine of them. So 125, 119, 128, 128, 119, 127, 105, 123, 115. Okay, so hopefully everything goes according to plan with this. So we're gonna quit and then we're gonna first see if this kind of takes on a, so I'm gonna go second stat plot. I'm gonna turn on my stat plot, turned it on. And now I'm going to go into um, graph. Oops. And so I get something that kind of looks linear. It looks a little bit clustered. Um, but it is somewhat linear and there's just really one bad value that's kind of off on the side. Um, so hopefully you guys something get something similar to me. So then I'm gonna to try to use my regression line. So I'm gonna go stat, test, linear regression, t-test. <clears throat> linear regression, t-test. Okay. Um, and then we're gonna do not equals and hit enter. And we should get an R of 0.79, I guess six if you wanna round off. So R equals 0.79 six and r squared is equal to 0.633 if we need it in general i'm going to try to stick to three decimal places with all of these um, calculations so the regression equation okay also told us that a and b equal something so a is worth negative 151.699 so about 0.700 and then B is worth 3.883. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully everything's going okay so far. Let me just double check, make sure all my work is right. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, so now they wanna know the regression equation. Well, according to the calculator, it says, and by the way, they normally use Y hat, um, to describe the regression equation because it's a predictor. It's not the exact value. It's trying to predict um, based on the data given. They say A plus BX. So this for me is going to be Y hat equals A is negative 151.700 plus 3.883 X. So this is the answer to the question. This is my regression equation, okay? We have an R of 0.7996, which seems to be um, a strong linear relationship um, besides that one little value. Um, but in general, it seems like it's gonna work pretty good. And it says, identify and interpret the slope of the y-intercept. So we know that the slope is 3.883. So it says as, and this is remember 3.883 over one. And um, let's see here, as height increases by one inch, weight increases by 3.883 pounds. Okay, because this is rise over run, right? This is rise over run. This is our old school slope that we're used to using. And we know that in this problem, weight is the Y coordinate and height is the X coordinate, right? This is my X, this is my Y. <clears throat> so they're saying that the weight um, is based on your height. That's the explanation, the explanatory versus the response variable. <clears throat> okay, and then the y-intercept kind of doesn't make sense because um, this problem, the y-intercept is negative 151. Okay, so it says when height is zero inches, which we know can't happen, when height is zero inches, weight is 
negative 151.7000. So this doesn't really make sense, um, pounds. So in this case, the y-intercept doesn't help us very much. The slope does help. Okay, so then it says, find the predicted weight of a supermodel who is 69 inches tall. So I'm going to do y hat equals, and I'm going to write down my, my regression equation. So now I'm going to do y hat of 69, and this would be negative 151.700 plus 3.883 times 69. So I'm just going to enter this in my calculator, negative 151.700 plus 3.883 times 69. And I get 116.227 pounds. Okay, so they're saying that if you predict the weight of us, if you want to predict the weight of a supermodel using our regression equation, we feel that if you're 69 inches tall, you'll weigh approximately 116.227 pounds. So let's see, was there anybody in here that was close to 69 inches tall? Let's say the 70s. So look at these people that were 70, these individuals that were 70 inches tall. Their weights were 119 and 127, and we get 116.227. So um, we're not really, we don't have a one, <clears throat> we don't have a 69 height to compare it to. But when we do the 70s, it seems like it's reasonable because the 70s are about 119, 123. Oh, there's another 70 here and a 127. Um, so we feel like 116, if you subtracted an inch, that would make sense. Okay. But maybe it's an under prediction. Maybe it's an over prediction. We'll talk about that more in the, um, the coming um, pages. Okay. So here it says, suppose the following data represents the time spent studying and the score on tests. So here we have our time spent studying. Here we have our score on tests. Okay, so we're gonna say that this is our X and this is our Y. So we're gonna find the regression equation. So once again, let's enter this into our calculator. We're gonna go to stat, edit. List one is gonna be zero, one, two, four, four, five, five, five. Six, six, seven, seven, eight. So is it 13 scores? Let me just make sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 scores. I just wanted to be sure. <clears throat> and then these are the matching scores to it. And remember, you're not just entering these in in any order. You're <clears throat> entering them in in the, the match pairs, right? Or not match pairs in terms of dependent variables, but these are, we're plotting, plotting points. So one X goes with this particular Y, this Y, or this X goes with this particular Y, so on and so on. 64, 69, 73, 70, 5, 68, 93, 84, 90, 95. Okay, so now I'm gonna get out of there and I'm gonna go to Stat, test, linear regression, t-test. So lin, regression, t-test. Okay, and it gives me an R equal to 0.922, I guess 0.923. And then it gives me an R squared equals, we don't need the R squared right now, but I'm just getting used to writing it down, <clears throat> 0.851. But it gives me a Y hat of 34.617 plus 7.73, no, I guess it's 7.4. Oops, I wrote it wrong. Seven, three, five, zero. If you round off, X. So this is my prediction. This is my regression equation that I'm going to try to use to predict things now. Okay. All right. So hopefully you guys got all that information the same as me. <clears throat> 
So it says identify and interpret the slope. So once again, we know the slope is 7.350 over one. So that means as, so let me see here, it says as hours spent studying goes up or increases, by one, test scores go up by how much? Let's see here, 7.350, okay? The y-intercept is 34.617. <clears throat> and it says, this means, uh, let me kind of separate this. Okay, so a y-intercept, that means when zero hours are spent, and let's see if this is spent study, spent study. Test scores will be 34.617. Six one seven, and again, this is the what the the regression line predicts. When you spend zero hours studying, you will get a thirty four percent. For every hour you spend studying, they predict that your score should go up about seven point three five percent from that thirty four. Okay, so use the line to determine the score of the test that the student studied for three hours. Okay, so I'm going to do my scatter plot just to take a look at this to make sure that everything's um, on par with where it should be. So I'm going to graph. I'm going to go to zoom stat and this looks very strongly like a um, really good um, line so if i wanted to graph my regression line on top of this i could and it looks very clean um, <clears throat> so it says use the line to determine the score of the test of a student study for three hours so we're going to do y hat of three hours and that will be 34.617 plus 7.350 times three, and let's see what we get. So 34.617 plus 7.35 times three. And I get 56.667% um, right? So this is in terms of percentages, okay? <clears throat> Determine the amount of time necessary to study to achieve 100 on the test. So we're gonna put the test score is equal to our y hat, right? So then that means that 100 equals 34.617 plus 7.350 x. So now we gotta use you guys as old school math where we're gonna solve for x. We haven't done a lot of that this semester. <clears throat> so I'm gonna do 100 minus 34.617 and I get 65.383 is equal to 7.350x. Let's divide both sides by x or by 7.350. So then we should have x equals, so divided by 7.350, 8.89. So we get 8.896 hours. So pretty much the predictor saying if you want to get close to 100, then you're gonna to need to study about nine hours, almost nine hours, okay? And again, it's not guaranteed, but this is just the, the data is showing that as your hours and studying go up, your grade gets higher, which makes sense to all of you in this class, right? So <clears throat> let's just talk a little bit about um, regression. So um, in a scatter plot, an outlier is a point lying far away from the other data points. Points that strongly affect the graph of a regression line are called influential points. Not all outliers are influ influential points, but all influential points are outliers, okay? Some outliers could just be errors, okay? <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, let's see here. Let's go down to here. Oh yeah, I wanted to talk about this. Um, residuals and least squares property. So it says, basically what the residual is, is the difference between the observed sample value and the predicted sample value, 
okay? So basically saying what you actually saw in the data versus what your um, regression line told you the answer should have been. You subtract those. So you take what you actually saw minus what the, um, <clears throat> the regression line told you or the line of best fit tells you, and you subtract them, and that's a residual. Now, if the residual is negative, that means that your um, regression line is over predicting the values, so they call that an over prediction. If the residual is positive, that means that the observed value was bigger than the predicted value, so it's an underestimation or an under prediction. So it's pretty easy to um, calculate residuals, okay? <clears throat> so let's go on to this next part. So here we have, for a person who weighs 188 pounds, what are the observed values of um, using this graph? Scatter plot of, I think this is systolic blood pressure versus weight. So they already gave us our y hat, and they already gave us our r. So they're telling us this is a strong linear relationship, and they're telling us we're using this prediction model of y hat equals 1.1 plus 0.764x. So we have our regression line, we're given everything, we just have to interpret the results. Now it says for a person who weighs 188 pounds, and I'm assuming that is this one and this one right here, it says what are the observed values for the systolic blood pressure using the graph? So it appears um, if we look at the graph, we would have 188 comma, uh, and the, it looks about, if you kind of go over here, that's about 137, I'm going to say. Um, you guys might get 136 or something like that, but let's just go with that. And right here, this looks like maybe really darn close to 150. So I'm going to say 188 comma 150. And again, this um, if you're using the computer program, you can probably be more exact and, and notice it right away <clears throat> instead of having to kind of eyeball it, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to use this, predict the systolic blood pressure for a person weighing 108 pounds. So we're going to now use our regression equation. So we're going to use the equation they gave us right here. <clears throat> so we're going to say y hat of 188. And it's going to tell us that this is 1.1 plus 0.764 times 188. And let's see what we get. So we get 1.1 plus... 0.764 times 188. And I get 144, oops, 144.732. Okay, so I get 144.732. All right. <clears throat> so now we're going to use, so this is our prediction. Okay, so based on our regression line, they're saying that this is what we should get. So we're gonna now find the residuals from this, okay? So we know that we're supposed to do y minus y hat and y minus y hat for each of our um, 188s, okay? So our actual value was 137 and we're gonna minus our 144.732 and we're gonna do our 150 minus 144.732. Okay, so let's see what we get. So 137 minus 144.732. I get negative 7.732. And over here, let's do 150 minus 144.732. I get 5.268, okay? So this is an over prediction, and this is a under prediction, right? And I'm just using what they set up here. They said if your residual is negative, the prediction is an over prediction. And that makes sense because that means that our residual, I'm sorry, that, may, that means that our predicted value is bigger than what was actually observed, which means our, we're overestimating. And when you get a positive, that means that our predicted was actually smaller than what was observed, so we're getting an under prediction, okay? So <clears throat> that's what the residual does. So this is the residual, okay, in each case. And we could do it for different numbers, you know, something that maybe didn't have two, you know, you could do it for any of these values, okay? So let's look at another one. 
Um, data on the IQ test scores and reading test scores for a group of fifth grade children give the regression line reading score equals point, negative 0 0.334 plus 0 0.82, 0 0.882 times IQ score. So the IQ score is your X, right? And this is your Y, okay? So find the predicted reading score for a child with an IQ score of 90, okay? So we're gonna say, let's see here. Um, I guess I could use red. Um, reading score, Y hat equals negative 33.4 plus 0.882 times 90. All right, Ooh, I should have done Y hat of 90. Okay, so let's see, negative 33.4 plus 0.882 times 90. And I get 45.98. So <clears throat> this is what you're saying, is you're saying that if a child has an IQ score of 90, they're gonna have a reading score of about 46. We have 45.98. So uh, again, they didn't give us the data associated with us, they just gave us the regression line, okay? And we're assuming that it's a good linear fit and everything like that, okay? Suppose that a child with an IQ score of IQ of 90 actually had a reading score of 50. Find the residual. Well, that means that Y equals 50, and we know Y hat is equal to 45.98. So then residual equals 50 minus 45.98, which is what? 4.02. And this is positive, so this would be an under prediction. Okay, so that's kind of how you can deal with um, residuals. <clears throat> and we're almost done. Um, let me see how much I'm going to go into this. So residual plot is a scatter plot um, of values after each of the y coordinate values has been replaced by the residual value. Okay, that is the residual plot is a graph of x and then whatever you got from the residuals. So instead of doing x comma y, you're going to do x comma residual. So residuals show how far the data fall from the regression line. Um, residuals help to determine how well line describes the data and the mean of the least squares residual is zero. Um, we're not going to do too much with that. I just want you guys to kind of see some key factors in this. This is just kind of more information. So it says features to look at on the residual plot indicate that it is a bad predictor. So usually large values of residuals because that means that you're getting really far away from the actual values that were observed, right? So if you have really big positive numbers or really big negative, you're either way over predicting or way under predicting. So that means that your regression line um, is kind of not working out well. Um, Nonlinear patterns um, of curvature. So like if you get parabolic or if you get, you know, um, something that definitely does not take on a linear shape. Um, fanning, where you start off small and it gets bigger and bigger. So uneven variation. And influential observations. Individual points whose removal would cause a substantial change in the regression line. So um, remember we talked about this as probably being um, an outlier that could cause problems. Um, and again, if the outlier is an error, it's probably not going to be counted as an influential observation. So what indicates a good predictive power? So small residuals. So when you get numbers that are very small in comparison, that means that your prediction and the actual observation are very close to each other, which means that your regression line is doing a good job of predicting behavior or predicting outcomes. Okay. So no pattern or curvature, uh, no patterns no curvature or fanning, even amount of residuals above and below zero. Okay, so you get some over predictions by a little bit, you get some under predictions by a little bit, um, and it kind of evens itself out, and very little clustering. So this would be an example, this first one, this is the residuals right here, right, and we're still using the same x coordinates. So when we do this, we get this new graph and these residuals are relatively small, right? Negative one, two, and three, and positive one, two, and three. That's not saying we're really far off. Um, we don't know the exact data, but we have to assume that it's pretty good. Um, and then if you notice, there's not some weird pattern 
Um, it doesn't look like it's a parabola. It doesn't look like it's gonna become like something strange. It just kind of looks like there's a good amount above the of over predictions and a good amount of under predictions and they all kind of even themselves out. So we're gonna say that this is a good predictor um, or good predictive power, okay? And um, it, I like the fact that it has this even variation. So, or I'll say even amount of positive and negative residuals, right? So we have, uh, you know, look, we have all of these guys that are above and we have all of these guys that are below and it's just about the same. So I feel pretty good about it. Now, this one is going to be what we would call a bad predictive, have bad predictive power. Okay. Um, and look at the look at the variation. It's parabolic. It takes on a parabolic pattern, <clears throat> so it's not even. So um, we're going to call this nonlinear pattern, nonlinear pattern. Okay, and then this one we're also going to say is a bad predictor, um, and this has fanning. See how it starts off small like right here. So we're here, we're starting off small and it's just kind of getting bigger and bigger. So that's what they call fanning. Okay. <clears throat> so that we are going to say is fanning. So not really our um, good predictors of what we're working with. Okay. <clears throat> now we take a look at this one. Notice the residuals. In, in comparison, the residuals seem pretty small. Look, you know, we have everything like right about here between negative um, two and two. So most of our values have small residuals. So we're gonna say this is a good predictor. Or, yeah, that's spelled wrong, predictor power. Okay, um, see, so let's list off a few things, small residuals or relatively small residuals. Okay, seems to have somewhat of an even pattern. We have some above, some below. Uh, I shouldn't say an even pattern, but it's, um, how do you say this? Uh, uh, even variation. Basically what we did up here on this one, even amount of positive and negative residuals, okay? In plus and minus residuals, okay? And then we could go one more. It doesn't seem to have any weird linear pattern or nonlinear pattern, so um, no patterns, I guess such as, um, you know, parabolic or fanning. Something nonlinear, okay. Um, so this is predictive power using residual plot below. So they say, um, let me read this problem real quick. So crickets make a chirping noise by sliding their wings rapidly over each other. The following output data is for temperature in Fahrenheit and number of chirps per second for the striped ground cricket. Okay, so they give us our R, our Pearson correlation coefficient. They give us our regression equation. So based on this information, would you guys feel comfortable using the number of chirps and temperature? Would you be feel comfortable using temperature to predict the number of chirps per second? Um, it seems like it, it would be a pretty good predictor because everything that we did here backs this up and says we should use this regression line, okay? Um, let's look at this one. I think this will be one of the last ones we do. Yeah, this is the last problem, I think. Okay, so um, city mileage, put it all together. We expect a car's highway gas mileage to be related to a city gas mileage. Data for all 
1,198 vehicles in the government's 2008 fuel economy guide give the regression line below. Um, we have a, we're assuming that it's a, a pretty good one. Um, it gives us our R. Um, let's see here. And it gives us Y hat equals 4.62 plus 1.109 times X. So this is gonna be our regression equation. This is my Y. Um, I should say Y hat, and this is my X, okay? Miles per gallon for city and highway miles per gallon is my Y. What is the slope of the line and interpret the slope? So we know the slope is 1.109, okay? And that means over one. And it says as city MPG increase by one, Highway MPG increase by 1.109. So again, you guys know that slope M is equal to rise over run, but you could call this your delta Y's over your delta X's, or people sometimes just say, um, uh, y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one. But whatever the case may be, your y is in the numerator and your x is in the denominator. So this is my x, this is my y, okay? Just kind of trying to explain to you guys where I'm getting this information from. So we know that the slope equals 1.109 as the city miles per gallon increased by one, that's our denominator, the highway miles per gallon increased by 1.109. It says, what is the y-intercept and interpret the intercept? So the y-intercept would be y-intercept equals 4.62. And this is saying when city MPGs equals zero, then highway equals 4.62, okay? Um, and again, sometimes these y-intercepts don't make a lot of sense saying zero, um, because obviously if it had zero city miles per gallon, the highway miles per gallon couldn't be 4.62. But again, they're just trying to have you understand what's the y-intercept, what's the slope. It says find the predicted highway mileage for a car that gets 16 miles per gallon in the city. So we're going to do y-hat of 16 equals 4.62 plus 1.109 times 16. And let's see what we get. 4.62 times, oops, I'm sorry, it's not times, plus 1.109 times 16. So I get 22.364, okay? So that means that the highway miles per gallon, we think, for a car that gets 16 miles per gallon in the city should get about 22 on the highway. So again, when you guys are looking at cars and you look at the window sticker, it'll say city MPG and then it'll say highway MPG. They're using some variation of this formula. Um, you know, they probably have done their own with their particular engines or whatever. So they're trying to use this as a predictor. They probably also um, actually do tests on miles per gallon um, on some kind of uh, data. So they don't use just predictors. They probably have a bunch of actual miles per gallons as well. Um, we basically are not given the data. We're just given the regression line that it came, that came from it. So um, they have the data already for themselves. It says, if a car gets 16 miles per gallon in the city, actually gets 21 miles per gallon, let's find the residual. Remember the residual is Y minus Y hat. So they said that the car that did get 16 miles per gallon, they recorded it as getting 21. And we said that our prediction was 364. So that means we're gonna have a negative residual. So we're gonna do 22.364 minus 21, or 21 minus that. So we're gonna get a negative 1.364, I believe, which means over prediction by 1.364 miles per gallon. And remember, whenever you get a negative residual, that just means that your prediction was bigger than the actual amount, which of course means over prediction. It says, what proportion of variation in highway miles per gallon is accounted for by city miles per gallon? 
what proportion of variation in highway monitoring is not accounted for. So you may not think you know how to do this, but we talked about the proportion of variation comes from R squared, but we already know R, they told us up here, R is 0 0.795. So we're gonna do 0 0.795 and we're gonna square it. So 0 0.795 squared, and this is 0.632, yeah, let's say 0.632. So this means 63.2% of highway MPG can be explained by city MPG. That's what R squared does for you. That's what um, the Pearson coefficient squared brings to the table is it allows you to um, come up with a number that just explains the chain or explains um, the outcome, the Y value, right? It says, well, 63% of what's affecting Y comes from the, or 63% of what's affecting highway miles per gallon comes from city miles per gallon. And then if you wanted to do the other one, the other question says um, is not accounted for. Well, you would just do one minus 63.2, I'm sorry, 0.632. and you would get, so we do one minus 0.632, and you would get 0.368 or 36.8% is not accounted for by city MPG, okay? So hopefully this helps you guys get started on the homework. Um, so this is the end of chapter 10. Um, something I want to remind you guys of, um, and I think there's one in the homework, is what if you discover that the model, so they ask you to build a regression equation, or they ask you to predict the outcome of something, okay? And let's say it turns out that your regression line, the data is not linear at all. It doesn't take on a good linear shape, so you can't use your regression equation. Well, the next thing you're supposed to use is the mean, okay? So it says, you could say the mean for predictions versus regression line or regression equation y hat, okay? So you have this, the mean for predictions, okay? Use the mean when the regression when the data does not fit a linear pattern for our class okay okay so the regression equation is better predictor is better at predictions if there is a strong linear correlation, okay? So if it has a strong linear correlation, then the um, regression equation is really good at prediction. Um, if it's a weak linear per, um, relation correlation or it doesn't have any linear pattern whatsoever then you should not try to use it even though your calculator will still give you the regression equation you should be using the mean instead the mean is like our old school the original way remember i talked to you guys if i said hey you t interviewed like 100 people that took my class and the average grade in my class was an 85 percent you know, would you take my class? Well, probably because you, you know, you're predicting that you would get around an 85% or better or around there or a little bit worse. But the mean is like our old school way of finding center. This is like our new fancy way. And this is like our old fashioned way, right? But the mean is still a good predictor. It's just not as good as a regression equation if we have a very strong linear relationship, okay? Um, so that's it, you guys. That's the end of chapter 10. Um, and I believe that will be the end of the course. Um, we're not going to cover anything new, I do not believe. Um, so let's get ready for the final and exam four and then the final after. I'm going to end the video.